Hello everyone. It's good to be with you today. Um, sorry I can't be there with you in person, but I'm very, um, I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here virtually. Uh, my name is Alyssa Joel. I'm with the Center for Climate Integrity, and um, it's really a privilege to be here and be part of this conversation and dialogue on climate change litigation in Indonesia. Um, I have been asked to give a brief overview of cl climate litigation in the United States, um, which is a difficult task considering um, that there is an incredible breadth of litigation that has been tested here in the U.S. and hundreds, possibly thousands of cases that might qualify as climate change litigation uh, being brought under various statutes and common law theories, uh, uh, causes of action. Uh, and more procedural uh, requirements and regulations. And I wanted to just give a very brief summary of the different categories and types of actions that are being brought, and then also share two case studies of two of the leading cases and types of litigation that we're seeing here in the U.S. So before I get launch into you know the types of actions that we're seeing uh, in the U.S., I just wanted to reference the, the Columbia law school center, uh, the Sabin Center, which uh, I'm guessing many of you might be familiar with already, uh, but it's an excellent resource. They have an incredible database of both U.S. and non-U.S. Uh, litigation efforts that are underway, um, and it, it really provides a very detailed summary uh, of each of these cases, and they've provided a number of reports and analyses uh, that can support you in your work and in learning more. So I recommend that you check them out at climatecasechart.com. Um, uh, and with that, I, you know, I, I wanted to talk about and break things down a little bit into categories and explain the types of legal actions that we're seeing in the U.S. Um, obviously, the, there are many efforts underway to hold governmental and corporate actors accountable for climate change. Uh, and in my mind, I have broken them down into mitigation, adaptation, monitoring and reporting and assessment of impacts as one category, uh, and rights and liabilities. Uh, and I think in the much of the action that we've seen has been related to mitigation. Um, there are a lot of actions underway to prevent or limit the funding or authorization of a source of greenhouse gas emissions. So that could be efforts to prevent the building, funding, or permitting of a coal power plant. Uh, there are a number of actions to overturn decisions that have refused to place limits on proposals to carry out fund or authorize those type, same types of emissions. So once a, a permit has been approved, uh, or any any type of authorization by by a government agency, there's a lot of efforts to challenge those de de uh, decisions. So any kind of infrastructure, coal power plants, uh, offshore oil de development, anytime a, a permit is granted, you know we are on the front lines trying to challenge those decisions. Uh, there are a number of actions that have been taken both at the federal and state level to require uh, the legislature or a government agency to write a statute or rule or policy establishing more stringent limits on greenhouse gas emissions um, through regulation. Uh, so one of the ways that we've done that is through uh, the Environmental uh, Protection Agency, which initially refused to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. And there was a landmark case called Massachusetts v. EPA. Uh, that basically said that no, carbon dioxide is in fact a pollutant that does need to be regulated. That pretty much sums up the the kind of the types of actions we're seeing on the mitigation front. Uh, on adaptation, there are far fewer cases involving adaptation. Uh, many of the cases that have been brought haven't been successful. Uh, but the more recent trend that we're seeing are actions to hold corporate actors, and specifically the fossil fuel companies, major fossil fuel companies, accountable for climate damages. And I'll speak about that in a bit more detail um, as one of the case studies. Um, a huge uh, monumental effort that was underway in some of the earliest lawsuits that were brought were in relation to monitoring and reporting and impact assessment. Uh, so we have a, a federal law that requires all, all public agencies to do ro robust review and uh, monitoring of, of the impacts of, of their projects, any major projects. 
Uh, and so these were actions that require public or private entities to undertake more extensive monitoring, impact and assessment, information disclosure uh, related to greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and des describing how they were going to take climate adaptation into account. So for example, uh, there have been lots of efforts to require federal agencies to take sea level rise into account in any type of coastal development. There has been quite extensive litigation with relate, uh, related to rights and liabilities um, that has involved applying human rights, property rights, or civil rights law, and taking actions that provide protection of individual or, or the public at large against the effects or responses to climate change. Um, so there have been cases that claim that greenhouse gas emissions have violated civil rights. So that's a bit of a very superficial overview of the types of actions that we're seeing uh, in the U.S. Uh, and then I wanted to focus a bit on two specific case studies. I think many folks around the world uh, and um, hopefully in Indonesia as well um, are really familiar with the Juliana v. U.S. lawsuit. Um, this was a lawsuit in, which in 2015, so going back several years, 21 youth and organizational plaintiff, uh, Earth Guardians, filed a constitutional climate lawsuit called Juliana v. U.S. against the United States government. And their complaint asserts that through the government's affirmative actions that cause climate change, it has violated the youngest generation's constitutional rights to life, liberty, and property, as well as failed to protect essential public trust resources. Uh, so this was a, a landmark case. Um, there has been a, an incredible youth movement that has um, come to life as a result of this case. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't met enormous success in the court system thus far. Um, it reached the, the Ninth Circuit, which is a federal appeals court in the U.S., and they determined that the remedy that the plaintiffs requested from the court, uh, which was essentially comprehensive climate framework that would address both em emissions reductions, mitigation, and the need to combat climate change adaptation, um, was beyond the scope of the courts, that this was an issue that needs to be addressed by our political branches, the executive and the legislature. Um, so it was essentially the court's way of punting this issue over to the other two branches of government. However, this case is not over. Uh, the plaintiffs have asked, these 21 youth plaintiffs, have asked uh, the court if they can amend their complaint. And the judge has ordered the parties to attempt to reach some kind of settlement. So that... That case is ongoing, and we will keep you all posted as it proceeds. Uh, there's another line of cases that I think um, will certainly be of interest as well, and these are the lawsuits brought by cities and states around the country against the major fossil fuel companies, BP, Chevron, Shell, ConocoPhillips, all of the big carbon majors. Um, these lawsuits were initially brought by a handful of California cities and counties, uh, seeking to hold the fossil fuel industry accountable for the lies and deception, the knowledge that they had that goes back to the late 50s, early 60s about the causes and consequences of climate change and how they have lied and deceived the public uh, since then uh, and, and for the damages they have caused as a result. Um, this work is very much premised on the carbon majors research, and I would imagine you'll be discussing that at some point during your, your few days together. Um, th this was an incredible piece of attribution science which helped to identify the top carbon polluters and their contributions to histor historic carbon greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this is you know particularly relevant in Indonesia, I think, because uh, Pertamina, hopefully I'm pr pronouncing that correctly, is one of the cases or one of the companies that was identified as one of the top emitters and producers. Um, the lawsuits in the U.S. Uh, that have been brought against these carbon majors have been modeled after litigation brought against the tobacco and pharmaceutical companies for the harms their products caused. And these have been tremendously successful in the U.S. context. Uh, they've been brought under consumer fraud and misrepresentation uh, for all of the false and deceptive and misleading information that these companies have put out into the public domain. 
Um, they've also been brought under public nuisance and other common law tort claims, product liability claims, um, seeking damages to property infrastructure and harm to public health. Um, we just received a very um, positive decision uh, from the Supreme Court earlier earlier this morning, so I'm happy to report um, that the Supreme Court declined to, to review one of the cases that was before them by the fossil fuel industry. Uh, so these cases will continue to proceed, and um, they've been in, in the pipeline, in the works for quite some time, um, and we will we'll see how they play out in, in state and federal courts. So the, all this to say is there is a lot of action in the U.S. There's um, a lot to, to learn from, both uh, the lessons learned are many. Um, we've had many successes, but also many failures, and, and we're continuing to adapt our legal strategies as we go. Um, and as I mentioned, I am uh, very available and happy to support your efforts if there are any questions that you have about my presentation or just U.S. Litig climate litigation more generally, please feel free to reach out. Um, I'm available at alyssa at climateintegrity.org, and I hope you all have a very successful meeting, uh, and I, I wish you all the best.